Good afternoon. I'm Carla Freeman, Director of the Foreign Policy Institute here at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, or SICE. It's my great pleasure and honor to welcome you to this event and to introduce the inaugural lecture of the Zbigniew Brzezinski lecture entitled The Subtle Dimensions of National Power, the U.S. in a Post-Pandemic World. The school is very grateful to the Stavros Niarchos Foundation for its support of this annual lecture that's a centerpiece of the Zbigniew Brzezinski Initiative here at SAIS. We're also immensely appreciative of the interest and support of the Brzezinski family, represented here today by Ambassador Mark Brzezinski. Thank you, Mark, and other members of your family, including Ian and Mika Brzezinski as well, who may be watching today or viewing the recorded program later. Again, we're so grateful for your support and your appreciation of the Zbigniew Brzezinski Initiative here at SICE. In addition to Dr. Brzezinski's role as a policymaker, including his service with such extraordinary distinction as National Security Advisor, Dr. Brzezinski was a member of the SICE family, a SICE professor of American foreign policy and senior fellow at the SICE Foreign Policy Institute. He's remembered at Johns Hopkins SICE not only for his legacy as a leading statesman, strategic thinker, and scholar, but also as an extraordinary teacher who was dedicated to educating the next generation of leaders in global affairs. This lecture celebrates his important legacy at SAIS by inviting a visionary expert to join our community of students, faculty, and staff to take a long view of American st strategy and policy. Our inaugural lecture uh, Secretary Leon Panetta could not better exemplify Dr. Brzezinski's realistic optimism, his strategic vision, and deep dedication to public service. Secretary Panetta began his own remarkable public service career in 1964 as a U.S. Army Intelligence Officer, receiving the Army Commendation Medal. Upon discharge, he moved to Washington, where he worked for the then U.S. Senate Minority Whip, Tom Keekel, of his native state of California. In 1969, our speaker was appointed director in the U.S. Office for Civil Rights, where he was responsible for ensuring equal opportunity in public education. Following other government roles, the secretary served his California Central Coast District in Congress for 16 years, chairing the House Budget Committee from 1989 to 1993, where his achievements included winning passage of the Hunger Prevention Act of 1988, Medicare and Medicaid coverage of hospice care for the terminally ill, and the creation of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, among other achievements. Secretary Panetta went on to direct the Office of Management and Budget and to serve as President Clinton's Chief of Staff. After his service in the Clinton administration, Secretary Panetta joined his wife Sylvia in establishing and co-directing the Panetta Institute for Public Policy at California State University, Monterey Bay, with the mission of attracting thoughtful individuals to lives of public service and preparing them for the policy challenges of the future, a mission very much in keeping with our own here at SICE. In 2009, Secretary Panetta left the institute he and his wife had formed to return to Washington to serve as the director of the CIA and then as Secretary of Defense under President Barack Obama. Today, Secretary P Panetta chairs the institute he founded in Monterey. Again, it's our huge honor to welcome him to SICE today virtually as our inaugural Zbigniew Brzezinski Annual Lecture Speaker. It's also my honor to introduce our Dean, Elliot Cohen, who is leading today's discussion with Secretary Panetta. Dean Cohen is also SICE's Robert E. Osgood, Osgood Professor. Dean Cohen received his BA and PhD degrees from Harvard, and after teaching there and at the Naval War College, he founded SICE's acclaimed Strategic Studies Program. His books include The Big Stick, Conquered into Liberty, and Supreme Command. In addition to public service in the Department of Defense, Dean Cohen served as counselor of the Department of State. He has also made the Zbigniew Brzezinski Initiative among the signature initiatives of his leadership at SAIS. In addition to this important lecture, the initiative includes other activities to support the development of leaders for the new challenges in international and global affairs, including student and postdoctoral fellowships. Before we start the program, in the event that you aren't familiar with the Zoom platform by now, I'd like to direct you to the Q&A feature on the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. We'll be using this for audience Q&A, which I think we will have time for later in the event. Uh, please type your questions there. 
when you do, please include your name and affiliation. Uh, we will not be using the chat function for Q&A. Thank you again, Secretary Panetta, for joining us this evening. And over to you, Dean Cohen. Great. Thank you, uh, Carla, so much. Um, I uh, uh, invite Secretary Panetta to uh, yeah. turn, on, turn on the video. Elliot, uh, they're, they're saying that the host has to do that. If you could do that, it'd be great. OK. Uh, there we go. There we are. All right. So we have some success. Excellent. So uh, first and foremost, let me uh, say how pleased we are here at SAIS to uh, be hosting the Brzezinski Initiative um, and how pleased we are to have you as our inaugural speaker. What we thought we would do is really do this as we've done other events here, which is as a kind of conversation um, in which we would engage in some back and forth on the topic for about half an hour or so, and then shift to Q&A. Again, I would, uh, I would urge people to put their questions in the q and I have a feeling it's gonna get pretty, uh, pretty crowded pretty quickly. Uh, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Um, and Mr. Secretary, what a pleasure it is to have you here. I just wish we were welcoming you in person. So I guess I'm, uh, Actually, I'm not going to begin with the topic of today's uh, lecture because, as you and I were discussing, you have literally half a century of public service behind you and in an extraordinary range of roles in Congress as White House Chief of Staff, Director of Central Intelligence, Secretary of Defense. But I think even more importantly, given where our politics are right now, uh, and this is a critical element of national security, I'm sure you would agree, you have an experience of a very different political era, where, which was um, in which people disagreed pretty forcefully, and the country was divided sometimes. Um, but there was a kind of partisan comedy that really seems beyond our reach today. I was wondering if you could just speak to that, and uh, partly to give the younger members of the audience some hope that actually, you know once upon a time this whole thing worked uh, and, and suggest how it might end up working again. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and first of all, let me say what an honor it is to uh, be able to be part of the uh, Brzezinski uh, lecture. Uh, I'm, uh, I knew Zvig when he was a national security advisor uh, and uh, we used to uh, work together on a number of issues, uh, both when I was uh, uh, in Congress as well as uh, in the administration uh, of Bill Clinton, and also uh, when I was both director of the CIA and Secretary of Defense, he was very helpful uh, and always had a great a great understanding of the challenges that the United States was facing in the world. Um, he he was truly. Uh, someone that uh, I admired because of his dedication to national security. So uh, thank you and thank the Brzezinski family uh, for uh, helping me to be part of this. Uh, I, you know, I, I've often uh, said that in my over 50 years of public life, I've seen uh, Washington at its best uh, and I've seen Washington at its worst. Uh, the good news is that I've seen Washington work. Uh, I first went back to uh, Washington after I got out of the Army. Uh, I think it was 1966. Uh, and I went to work uh, as a legislative assistant to uh, a Republican senator from uh, California by the name of Tom Kekel. Uh, and Kekel came out of uh, the uh, kind of progressive Republican legacy of California that started with Hiram Johnson, Earl Warren, and others like that. Uh, and in the, in the Senate at that time, there were a number of uh, Republicans like Tom Kekel. Uh, some of, I'm sure uh, the students won't recognize these names, but I think Elliot will. Uh, names like Jacob Javits from New York, uh, Clifford Case from New Jersey, Hugh Scott from Pennsylvania, George Aiken from Vermont, uh, Cooper uh, from uh, Kentucky, Mark Hatfield from Oregon. Uh, 
There were a number of moderate Republicans, and they work with uh, Democratic senators like uh, Henry Jackson, Magnuson, uh, Dick Russell, uh, Sam Irvin, uh, Fulbright, a number of others. They had their political differences, as they do now. But on big issues, they were willing to work together. And as a result of that, uh, there was a lot of landmark legislation that was passed in those days on civil rights, on the environment, on education, on labor, a number, number of other issues. But when I got elected to Congress, Tip O'Neill was the speaker, kind of a Democrat's Democrat from Massachusetts. But he had a very good relationship with Bob Michael, who was the minority leader from Illinois. And again, did they have their differences? Of course they did. But they, they also believed that when it came to important issues in the country, they should work together. And so Republicans and Democrats did work together, whether it was a Republican president or a Democratic president. Under Ronald Reagan, as a Republican president, a bipartisan Congress passed social security reform, which is the so-called third rail of politics these days. Nobody, nobody wants to touch it. We passed social security reform. We passed comprehensive tax reform. We passed immigration reform. We also passed budgets uh, and we worked on foreign policy issues together. Uh, that was governing. And frankly, governing was good politics. Uh, today, because of the divisions and the partisanship and the polarization that we see, uh, it's become much more difficult for the parties to be willing to sit down and to work together to find solutions to the problems. I'm almost convinced when, when I was there, governing was good politics. Today, I'm not sure that governing is considered good politics. Stopping the other side, confronting the other party, uh, is what uh, kind of is at the center of politics these days. Uh, and so the result is on major issues, obviously, that we're confronting, uh, it's very difficult to get both sides to work together. Uh, and it creates a dysfunction that not only damages our democracy, I think it also impacts on our national security. Because I think the reality is certainly when it comes to national security issues, uh, both parties have always come together in order to deal with the kind of national security challenges we face. And today, my sense is that even those issues have become more partisan. So I hope, I mean, look, there is some hope here. I think Joe Biden is from an old school. He believes uh, in, in the importance of governing. Uh, I think there are newer members that have gotten elected that believe in governing and don't want to just pound their shoe on the table. But I think it, this, the challenge that we face today is the challenge of being able to have both parties, yes, have their politics, have their differences, but in the end, recognize that they both have to work together in order to solve the major problems facing our country. I hope we can reach that point again. Yeah, I hope so. I uh, just wonder what the trajectory is that way. But I think it, it is a useful reminder for everybody to know once upon a time it was that way and it, it really can work. Well, let me, we'll come back to that perhaps in a little bit. Um, but let's go directly to the topic of, uh, of, of your remarks, and that is the subtler dimensions of national security. What, what exactly are you thinking of? Um, what are they? Are they overlooked? And then I, what I want to do is see if we can see how they relate to some of the more traditional national security issues that uh, we also face. Yeah, you know, uh, we have, we've seen the importance of American leadership in the world since World War II. Uh, and it was the result of American leadership uh, that produced the Truman Doctrine uh, that was involved in creating the UN, 
uh, the Marshall Plan, that uh, that in the end was responsible for bringing down the Soviet Union uh, and the and the Berlin Wall. Uh, America exercised leadership uh, in facing a number of challenges in the world. We made our share of mistakes, uh, but the United States was always there trying to provide important leadership. Uh, I think what we saw, obviously, in the last four years was uh, this approach of trying to gradually withdraw from a leadership role in the world. Uh, and try to retreat into an America first mentality. Uh, and the problem with that is that rather than having an America that was prepared to engage in the world and deal with the challenges that were out there, uh, America went AWOL on, on many of the, uh, the issues uh, that uh, were confronting this country. Uh, I think it is important with this new administration and a new president that he has said that America is back and that America wants to play a role of world leader. And it comes at a time when there are a number of challenges that we are facing, perhaps more flashpoints in the world today than since World War II. Uh, we're facing uh, the challenge of dealing with a China that uh, has been empowered uh, these last four years uh, and has moved forward to kind, of, to kind of fill the vacuum left by the United States when it comes to leadership. Uh, and so China, uh, as evidenced by the intelligence assessments that were presented to the Congress within the last few weeks, China is, uh, is at the top of the list in terms of, uh, of the potential threat to uh, secure the security of the United States. Russia, a close second. Uh, and we're, we're dealing with a Russia where uh, Putin, uh, recognizing that what he considered to be weakness on the part of the United States the last number of years uh, decided to take advantage of that weakness uh, by going into the Crimea and the Ukraine, going into Syria, uh, conducting the kind of cyber attacks that uh, impacted on the United States uh, during our elections. Bold, bold cyber attacks uh, by Russia. Uh, and I think that it is important that the United States again has to make clear to, to Putin and to Russia that uh, there are lines that need to be drawn with regards to Russian behavior. Doesn't mean we can't negotiate, doesn't mean we can't talk, but we have to do it from strength. Same thing's true with China. We have to deal with them, but deal with them from strength. Uh, we're facing obviously the threat from North Korea uh, and uh, the fact that uh, nuclear weapons are continuing to be uh, developed there. We're facing the potential threat of a nuclear weapon in Iran uh, as they enrich fuel. Uh, we're facing failed states in the Middle East, uh, which create a breeding ground for terrorism, which is another threat that we still face. Uh, not, obviously, 9-11 marked the beginning of the war against terrorism. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, in a couple of days, we'll celebrate the 10th anniversary of the uh, operation that went after bin Laden. But terrorism still remains a threat out there with ISIS and others that we have to confront. Uh, and we have to deal with some of the new technological threats, particularly with cyber. Cyber is the battlefield of the future. So in all of these potential areas, the question becomes, can the United States provide leadership that can hopefully manage these threats that are out there? Uh, 
foreign policy is not necessarily about solving problems. Foreign policy in many ways is about how do you manage uh, these kinds of threats uh, in a way that protects our national security. And I do think that the Biden administration seems to understand that it has to put in place the elements of leadership, the elements of alliances, working with our allies uh, together to, to confront uh, these issues, and more importantly, to identify exactly who our adversaries are uh, and what threatens uh, the stability of the world that the world community has to confront. Wow, you've given, uh, you've given me a lot to unpack. So let me uh, begin again. Uh, let me also remind people to uh, use the uh, Q&A function, if you would, uh, if you have uh, questions you want to put to uh, Secretary Panetta. So uh, I guess the first um, follow-on question really is, well, are we so sure that other countries still want the United States to lead? I mean, I, you know, uh, you're a bit older than I am, but I, you know, I certainly, the world that I grew up in, it was understood that the United States was, as the phrase went, the leader of the free world. I mean, that was, you know, just the stock, a stock phrase. And really for quite some time, that is what people expected of the United States. And I think you could argue in large measure what they wanted. Um, after not just the last four years, but a, you know, a period where we were talking about nation building at home or, you know, where people were looking at the Iraq war and wondering, do we really want to follow those guys? Um, what is the basis of American leadership now, would you say? I think that, uh, that President Biden has kind of touched on what has to constitute the, the fundamental principle that brings the United States and our allies together, uh, which is democracy. Uh, and we have seen autocracy taking hold the last number of years. Uh, we've seen what Putin has done. We've seen what China has done. We've seen what has happened with Poland. We've seen what has happened in other countries. Uh, and yet, I think the fundamental, the fundamental strength of the United States going back to World War II has been our values and what we believe in. Uh, the dignity of the individual, the ability to self-govern, the ability to enjoy uh, basic liberties and freedoms. Uh, I think that still remains the heart and soul of what is our strength. And ultimately, our ability to appeal to our allies has to be based uh, on those values. Now, there's no question that trust has to be restored. I think trust was badly damaged uh, with our allies uh, when the United States uh, walked away from the Paris uh, Climate Agreement, when the United States walked away from uh, TTP, when the United States walked away from the Iran uh, nuclear agreement, uh, and when the United States was critical of NATO uh, and our allies in NATO. Uh, all of that created tremendous distrust of whether or not the United States uh, would be there when necessary in order to confront uh, some of these challenges. I think Joe Biden, through what he has said and how he has communicated uh, his, uh, his belief in American leadership to others, uh, the calls that he's made, uh, to our friends abroad, the signals that he sent uh, with regards to recognizing who our adversaries are and problems that we have to deal with. Uh, I think he's, he's laid some important groundwork uh, in which to ultimately begin to bring our allies together, uh, to be able to work together on the many issues that I described. But 
as always, the tests will be not our words, but our actions. Yeah. And that, I think, is where, where the decision will rest as to whether or not we're successful or not in building the kind of alliances we are absolutely going to have to have if we're going to deal with the myriad of flashpoints I just described. You know, I think it's a cliche, but it, uh, it became a cliche because it's true that um, every new administration gets tested and gets tested sooner than it expects it to happen by somebody poking you in the eye. Um, and that can really set the tone for, you know, an entire presidential term. Where, where do you think that is likely to happen for the Biden administration? Well, again, if you, uh, if you look at uh, those threats that are out there, uh, it could happen on any number of fronts. It could happen with China over Taiwan. Uh, China obviously has asserted itself in Hong Kong. Uh, it's taken actions against the Uyghurs. Uh, and it continues to threaten uh, action against Taiwan. Uh, I think that could be one of the areas uh, that uh, could very well uh, require the United States uh, to respond in some fashion. Uh, Russia, we saw Putin build up forces recently along the border with Ukraine. Uh, placing tanks and uh, uh, additional military personnel along the border. Uh, there was a tremendous concern that, uh, uh, that they might indeed take some action, uh, largely because Putin is having problems in Russia. Uh, and uh, when Putin has political problems in Russia, he usually tries to see if there's a way he can restore uh, his, uh, his persona by going after somebody. Uh, fortunately, that didn't happen, or at least they backed off for the moment. Uh, but I think uh, the potential for what could happen in the Ukraine or the Belarus uh, areas are, are two other uh, hotspots for us to watch. Uh, I think that uh, there's no question that Iran remains another potential uh, hotspot even though there's an effort now to try to see if we can bring them back to the table uh, and to accept the limits on nuclear enrichment uh, that went with the, uh, uh, the nuclear agreement. Uh, it's obvious that uh, there is an element in Iran that continues to want to challenge the United States. Uh, we saw Navy ships in the Gulf just within the last few days being challenged uh, by Iran. Uh, and it's, even though, you know, we've seen those provocations before, the problem you have, and I say this as a former Secretary of Defense, is that when you have these kinds of incidents that challenge one another, that it creates the possibility of misjudgments being made uh, that can suddenly erupt uh, in some kind of violent action. So uh, I, I think there's no question Iran uh, remains a threat. North Korea is another uh, unpredictable rogue nation with a rogue leader in Kim Jong-un. Uh, and uh, although there was this uh, summitry between Trump uh, and Kim Jong-un to try to see if they could uh, somehow through the uh, the power of their personalities be able to resolve the issue of denuclearization, which never happened. Uh, the problem is that this is a leader who's going to continue to develop nuclear weapons, continue to develop his missiles, because I think he believes the only protection he has for his regime, frankly, is to maintain uh, some degree of nuclear power. Uh, but he also challenges uh, and he creates incidents as well. So that's another, obviously, uh, potential hotspot. 
So uh, those are some, some of the areas. Uh, add Afghanistan to that uh, mix. Uh, add Iraq to that mix. Add the failed states in the Middle East, such as Yemen and Libya and Syria, to that mix. Uh, and you have got a number of potential hotspots uh, that the United States is going to have to deal with. Yeah, so l let me uh, perhaps get a little bit more uh, specific. You know, you were talking about the issue of ambiguity. And uh, as you know, one of the key elements in our dealings with Taiwan uh, uh, and dealing with China over Taiwan has been what's called the doctrine of strategic ambiguity. That is, we don't say that we would come to the aid of Taiwan if it was attacked by the PRC, but we kind of put in enough uh, uncertainty so that we hope that that will deter China from trying anything that's um, any, any overt use of force. Recently, quite a few people, uh, including Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, has said, you know what, time to, um, to turn away from that, uh, from, this, from the policy of strategic ambiguity and be unambiguous uh, because we're dealing with a different China than we were dealing with before. What's, what's your view of that? Uh, I, I think that makes some sense that uh, I don't think we can afford to play the same game with ambiguity that we have in the past. Uh, and, and the problem is that the reason is that China, I think, has, uh, has made the decision that they are now going to become uh, the, uh, the primary world power in the world uh, above the United States. They've said that. Uh, their leaders have said that, uh, that they're going to become the, uh, the consummate uh, world power in the 21st century. Uh, and that's because uh, I think they've read weakness on the part of the United States uh, and feel that they can take advantage of that position. Uh, and clearly, they were able to do to go into Hong Kong uh, and not uh, and not really face any kind of opposition from the world community, including the United States. Uh, and so, I think there is a possibility that they could exercise their muscle uh, in Taiwan as well. And for that reason, I think it's important for the United States to send a clear message. Uh, that uh, the United States is not going to allow that to happen. I think you can do that uh, by continuing to provide additional military assistance to Taiwan, uh, uh, continue to make sure that uh, uh, our Navy continues to exercise in that region uh, to indicate that uh, we're serious about it. So, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that, uh, you know, we have to uh, declare that uh, we will act, but we sure as hell can take some steps to send a much clearer message to China that the United States is not going to stand back and allow Taiwan to be invaded. Yeah. So I, uh, and again, I'm, I'm actually drawing on a number of the questions that are in the Q&A, so I don't want you to, folks out there to think I'm ignoring them. I'm not. Um, you know, I vividly remember when President Clinton came to size to, uh, I don't know if you were there or not, but he was, uh, and he spoke about the importance of bringing China into the WTO. It was a, it's kind of hard to describe a somewhat wonky speech as mesmerizing, but it was both wonky and mesmerizing. I mean, he really, you know, you had to sounds be like, impressed. Sounds like Bill Clinton. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he, he, he uh, and then uh, in a, what I thought was a, uh, shed what a, you know, skilled politician he was. He, yeah. he, made, he made as if to leave, and then he kind of plunged into uh, the, the front rows where we had all the students who you know, were swooning um, as they shook hands with the President of the United States. But you know, he made a very powerful case for why bringing China into the WTO would, you know, would not just be economically beneficial to us, but this was part of the, a process of integrating a country that had been really on the outs with the international system for quite some time to bring it in, and that there was a there was a kind of a theory of sort of amelioration behind it, which I, to be fair, I think everybody pretty much believed in. I, I there were not that many people who said no, no, that's not going to 
that just won't work with the Chinese Communist Party being what it is. Um, in retrospect, were we wrong? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so for the time uh, and for uh, the situation as it existed at that point. Uh, I think there was uh, a continuing dialogue that was going on between the United States and China. We had pretty good uh, relationships uh, in terms of dealing uh, both with trade and uh, with the economy uh, and uh, with other issues. Uh, and uh, there was an effort uh, to continue to try to bring uh, China uh, you know, into the 21st century with regards to, uh, 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 to, to recognizing uh, international rules uh, and international regulations. Uh, so I, I think it made sense. I think where it went wrong uh, was that, uh, you know, during, during these last four years, uh, as we initiated a trade war with China, uh, as we uh, took actions uh, that, that really kind of, in many ways were read by uh, China as not only unpredictable, but uh, out of the ordinary in terms of where was the United States? Well, you know, what exactly were they trying to accomplish here? Uh, and also, in recognizing that uh, that the United States uh, had walked away from the TTP uh, uh, approach to dealing with trade and developing trade relations in that area, uh, I think uh, China read weakness in, in, into uh, what the United States was doing. Uh, and the result is that uh, China she has made clear uh, that he's going to be in power. Uh, he has basically reinforced his position uh, as leader in China. Uh, they did move with regards to Hong Kong. They are continuing a very aggressive campaign uh, with the Belt and Road Initiatives, uh, trying to spread their influence around the world, trying to take advantage of uh, trade markets, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia. Uh, they are continuing to be very aggressive. Uh, and I think it is important at this point for the United States to again reassert that there are areas uh, that we believe China cannot cross, lines that cannot be crossed. Uh, South China Sea, uh, their willingness to go there and militarize islands in the South China Sea is unacceptable. Uh, and it is important that the United States continue to make clear that those are not only in violation of international law, but are impacting on freedom of the seas. Uh, and therefore, I think we have to continue uh, to make clear that our Navy is going to continue to go through uh, those, uh, those areas because they are international, uh, and, uh, and we will not abide by their effort to try to place the South China Sea under their uh, total jurisdiction. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, on Hong Kong, I think we ought to make clear that, uh, you know, we're going to continue uh, to try to see if we can get Hong Kong uh, to be able to assert uh, some degree of independence when it comes to uh, self-rule there. Uh, I think we ought to make clear on Taiwan that we will uh, not allow them uh, to assert that same kind of control over Taiwan. I think we have to make clear that what they did with the Uyghurs is a violation of human rights uh, and that we will uh, make clear to the international community that that kind of behavior cannot be accepted. We have to assert our strength. That's what I'm, I'm arguing for. We've got to make clear that the United States uh, believes that there are lines that China cannot be allowed to cross. Now, having done that, if we do that successfully, 
I think that gives us the room then to be able to carry on a dialogue on trade, uh, on technology, on economic issues, uh, on climate change, uh, so that you know, we can find areas where we can, in fact, work together. But unless we assert our strength as a nation in the values that we believe in, and that we will back it up with force if necessary, I think China will continue to take advantage of that kind of weakness. So we have to begin by making clear to China that we are not pushovers when it comes to issues that we care about, particularly in the Pacific. So, so let me ask you, um, you know, you've been wearing your policy hat, um, wearing your politician hat. Um, do you think the American people have the stomach for that, that kind of forceful and principled policy, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China? I mean, after all, you know, you can argue that not just in the Trump administration, but even to some extent before, you know, the United States has been going through this rather inward looking period, uh, nation building at home and so forth. Um, and uh, there's, you know, a bit of a repudiation of the centrality of a values driven foreign policy and, you know, look at the mess it got us into here and uh, here and there. What do you, how do you assess the, the tolerance of the American people for a policy like the one that you've outlined? I, I think if, uh, if Joe Biden makes clear that in order to deal with China on trade, on technology, on economic issues, uh, and the kind of issues that impact uh, on American workers, uh, that the United States has to make clear to China that there are areas that uh, we are not going to allow them uh, to extend their influence. Uh, and I, I think the one thing the American people understand is that when it comes to confronting those that they view as having taken advantage of the United States, uh, they will respect toughness in dealing with them. Uh, but I, look, the President of the United States has to make that case yeah. to the American people. Uh, that in the end, this is not about uh, creating uh, the potential for war. It's about creating the potential for a peaceful relationship. Hmm. The only way you do that is by flexing your muscle, uh, not by running and hiding. Hmm. So let me, um, this is fascinating. Uh, I want to move us to a different subject that a number of people have asked about. You know, in a way what we've been talking about is quite traditional. It's geopolitics um, on a grand scale. Uh, we're, in the middle of this pandemic, uh, it's thankfully in the United States, you can, I think, see all kinds of um, cracks of light. Uh, uh, but in other parts of the world, it's getting a lot worse, most notably India, of course. Uh, I, I'm curious, how do you think the pandemic is going to shape international politics and specifically the American role in the world and American leadership. But, but if you could just kind of roam around the world and say, what differences do you think this is going to make? Well, you know, I, I think it's been, it's been damaging to, uh, to the United States uh, in, in the sense that uh, rather than applying the kind of world leadership that I think the United States has been known for uh, in the past, that instead uh, the United States kind of said to hell with the rest of the world on the pandemic, we got to take care of ourselves, uh, deal with our, our issues. And, you know, look, I, I understand the politics of that because uh, 
we went through hell this last year uh, with the pandemic. But I do believe that this is a great opportunity for the United States to now reach out to the world and try to help other countries deal with this pandemic. Uh, what we did with India is, is very important. Uh, India is having, uh, as we've all seen, a tragic problem with the spread of the pandemic uh, among their people. Uh, and the ability to provide uh, vaccinations, provide other medical assistance, I think is particularly important uh, in, uh, in the relationship with India. Uh, I think that same approach should be taken in dealing with other countries because, look, I, I think right now this whole pandemic is, is producing a really mixed record. You know, the United States, we've obviously made some gains. We've obviously moved ahead with our vaccinations. Uh, our economy is beginning to open up. Uh, it looks like we're in pretty good shape. Great Britain, uh, the same thing seems to be happening there. Uh, but when you look at other countries, I mean, there are countries in Europe that uh, seem to be on the right track as well. But when you look at Africa, when you look at Asia, when you look at Latin America, uh, it is, you know, it's a prescription for continued unrest when it comes to uh, these countries being impacted by the pandemic. Uh, and unless there is a global approach here, to dealing with the pandemic. Uh, same argument you can use for climate change. If there isn't a global approach to climate change, well, we're not gonna deal with climate change because it's a global problem. Uh, the same thing is true for the pandemic. I think if the United States handles this right, it could be an opportunity where we can again provide assistance to these countries that's needed, but then leverage that assistance uh, in building the kind of alliances we're going to need for the future to confront not only this, but other problems as well. Mm. Um, let me move on to another question that's uh, come up in the Q&A. Uh, the decision to withdraw forces from Afghanistan. Um, you know, on the one hand, it's the forever war. It's gone on for 20 years. Uh, arguably, neither the Obama nor the Trump administration wanted to be in that war, neither really pulled the plug. Uh, and you can certainly understand why there's a desire to say, okay, we're, we're done with an active role. On the other hand, there, there are two powerful, three powerful counter arguments, I suppose, that have been made. Uh, one by somebody we both know and respect, General Dave Petraeus, that, you know, that you will lose capacity if you pull out the remaining 3,500 troops. Secondly, the argument that actually, you know, this is not a hugely costly uh, investment in, in lives or money. I mean, we've not been actually taking very many casualties at all in Afghanistan. Um, and then there is, you know, the argument of to values, as, as you've been discussing so eloquently before, the, particularly the fate of, uh, of Afghan women you know, whose status really benefited in profound ways from the American presence. So how should we think about that kind of difficult decision? It, uh, it's, it's, it's been a challenging issue uh, going back to 9-11 uh, and uh, each administration uh, that's tried to deal with it. Uh, has seen how challenging it is. Uh, but I begin with a very fundamental principle. 9-11 was an attack on the United States of America uh, by terrorists, by Al-Qaeda and by bin Laden. Uh, and as a result of the 9-11 attack, we went to war. And the purpose of that war was to go after those that were responsible for the 9-11 attack and to make certain that 
we would do everything necessary to ensure that America would not have to confront another 9-11 attack. Uh, and that's why we went into Afghanistan. Uh, it was for the purpose of going after those terrorists uh, and making clear that uh, Afghanistan uh, would not become a safe haven for terrorists again. Uh, and that was uh, the whole purpose of uh, going after bin Laden, uh, was to make clear that, uh, that we, were, we were seeking justice here for what uh, he had done in terms of attacking uh, our country. Uh, and that we were not going to allow him or others to again put together a plan of attack on the United States. So that brings us to uh, the decision uh, by the president. Uh, because frankly, you know, the policy on Afghanistan has been a little bit of hit and miss uh, in which uh, one part of it was designed to uh, help Afghanistan become a country that could secure and govern itself. Another part of it was to confront uh, the terrorists that were uh, continuing to plan attacks against the United States uh, and use counterterrorism to go after them. Uh, but the big problem was that uh, Afghanistan itself uh, was not providing the kind of partnership uh, that was necessary to be able to achieve the kind of objectives uh, I was talking about. Uh, and so, you know, I can understand uh, Joe Biden's looking at the situation and saying, you know, a few thousand troops are not going to make uh, any difference. The Taliban is going to continue to exert uh, further control there. Uh, and I can understand the frustration of, uh, of having to struggle with the idea that we might be enmeshed there for a long time to come. But I also do not think that even though we may decide to withdraw our forces, that we can withdraw from our responsibility to make sure that Afghanistan doesn't again become a safe haven for terrorism. And that is, that's the gamble here that uh, concerns me, that if we simply withdraw our troops and then withdraw our support for Afghanistan, that the Taliban will in fact uh, be able to assert more control there uh, and uh, undermine a lot of the progress that has been made uh, in education and with women and with governing there. So I think the answer here is that the United States must continue to have a strategy of supporting Afghanistan in the effort to try to make sure that the Taliban does not take control. We need to continue to provide diplomatic uh, assistance and help. We need to continue to provide aid. We need to continue to provide military assistance and training. And yes, I think we need to continue to provide counterterrorism uh, operations. Uh, I think the Biden administration has talked about over the horizon capabilities. Knowing the military and knowing special forces, I think they have the capability to do that. We're going to have to establish the basis and the strategy to be able to make that work. But I think it is incumbent on the Biden administration to make clear that we are not just going to sit back and allow the Taliban to reestablish a safe haven for terrorism. Otherwise, we will not only have failed, but we will be repeating the same mistake that was made in Iraq. Well, that's a fairly somber note. I, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, actually, I wanted to ask you about 20 more questions, but uh, unfortunately, we're 
coming to the end of uh, this phase of the event, I'm going to call on Carla Freeman in just a moment. But I, I really want to thank you for the, the, kind of the depth of the thoughtfulness of your responses to these questions. And I, I, I will say, just as, a, as somebody who's been involved in foreign policy debates as well, it seems to me, you know, what you're saying is... Um, it is a strong element of what remains a bipartisan consensus. You know, I, I, I doubt that you think of yourself as an outlier uh, on these issues. I certainly wouldn't think of you that way. And to go back to the way we, very, we began the discussion, it does give me some hope that I think there's actually a lot of common ground, certainly I would say at the expert level. I mean, you know, at a broader kind of noisy political level, maybe not so much. Um, but, you know, in that way, it, it strikes me that actually a lot of us really agree on many more things than we disagree with, uh, with one another. So thank you so much for that. Carla, let me turn the floor over to you. You're easier said than done, Dean Cohen. So I, I think uh, <laughs> my video is not coming on either. So I will, I will uh, simply say uh, uh, this has been a fascinating and illuminating discussion. And I want to thank you, uh, Secretary Panetta and Dean Cohen. Uh, thank, thanks again to the Brzezinski family. Uh, also, thank, uh, my thanks to colleagues who made this event happen. And I should add special thanks to Associate Dean Roth as well. I want to thank especially the audience for joining us and contributing to the discussion uh, with their many incisive questions. Uh, thanks all. Uh, and thanks again, Secretary Panetta, for inaugurating this lecture series in Brzezinski's memory. Great. Well, thank you very much. That ends uh, this, this part of the event. Uh, and Mr. Secretary, I'm going to look forward to speaking with you a bit more. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, my thanks to you and to all the staff there, again, the Brzezinski family, uh, and also to all the students. I, I really uh, think you're in one of the outstanding institutions uh, in our country when it comes to uh, foreign policy. Uh, and uh, I wish you all the very best. Our country needs your leadership in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all.